how did I go from a mild-mannered PhD student to working in California? And by the way, you might think that this is a joke. It is not a joke. When I got out to California, I said, I've got a real job. Maybe I can afford a house. And I looked for the cheapest house that they had, and it was $400,000. And I said, okay, that's a lot of money, but let's go look at that house. And it had dirt floors. <laughs> okay? So there are some really good parts to North Carolina. I just want to call that out. So, so how did I get from mild-mannered PhD student to working at an internet startup in the dot-com days? I have to give credit to a couple different people. So UNC Chapel Hill, they want you to take a couple outside classes. They want you to be well-rounded. And so I looked for the closest classes that I could get to computer science. And that was information and library science. So I got to take two courses during the summer of 99. So I, Gary Marcinini, I see him in the audience, I believe, and, and Bob Lossie. And they were both classes on search engines. And it was really fun. We got to write our own search engine. We learned about term frequency and inter, inverse document frequency and all sorts of cool stuff. And I really enjoyed it. And so that sort of planted the seed in my mind a little bit. And then I got an interesting email from VA Linux. I don't know if you guys ever remember VA Linux, but they went public. And as part of going public, they sent out an email and they said, I got one, out my CS, UNC.edu. And the email said, thanks for contributing to Linux. We would like to give you 100 free shares of VA Linux. Now, my contribution to Linux was not writing code. I had written some documentation. Back then, trying to record a CD was like voodoo, like, you know, how much chicken blood do you need, and you sacrifice it at a full midnight and the full moon, and Linux was twice as bad. You needed twice as much chicken blood. So I had written a little CD recorder how-to, and because of that, my email address was associated with the Linux kernel distribution, and so they said, we want to give you 100 free shares. I was like, okay, that's awesome. It's friends and family shares. That means you can sell it the first day. I was like, this is cool. So I was using Elm. And they sent it as an attachment. There was a form to fill out. And it was in Adobe Acrobat reader format. And I was like, I don't have the way to deal with that right now. I'm just going to put that aside, and I'll deal with it later. Yeah, you're shaking your head. You realize what's coming up. So December 1999, VA Linux went public. The shares went to $320 the first day. And that was the day I realized I hadn't filled that form out. <laughs> As a grad student, I was making about $14,000 a year. And if you think about what it's like to lose $30,000 because you didn't fill out a form because of Adobe Acrobat Reader, it feels like this. Ah! So that was another thing that planted the seed. Um, and then I had a really good advisor. I've had multiple good advisors. But my advisor at the time, I talked to Gary. And he said, look, it might do you some good. And uh, you can always come back. You know, people had gone to Evans and Sutherland and other companies, and they had made their way back. So I said, okay, let's move across the country, get married, you know, take a one-week honeymoon, drop out of the PhD program. If you make a list of the stressful things, I checked like five out of the top seven. You know, drive across the country, and 15 years ago this month, I started at Google. So the very first major project that I had was kind of interesting. I was sitting in my cubicle. I was working on how to make regular expressions faster for a string matcher. So if you've ever done that in your computer science classes, that is exactly the sort of thing we work on at Google. And a manager came to my desk and she said, Matt, how do you feel about pornography? <laughs> now, if somebody comes to you and asks that question, I recommend that you take a second and think about it <laughs> before you answer that. It had a very large impact on my career, as it turns out. Because I said, that depends. Why are you asking? <laughs> and she said, well, we have a client, a partner of Google, who would like to have a family-safe version of Google. And we would like you to write the porn classifier so that we can have a safe version of Google. And I said, oh, OK. In that case, yes, I will help you with your pornography problem. Um, I'm not going to show any pictures of pornography. Enjoy these nice cookies instead. <laughs> So I worked on it for two or three months. I trained against the adult category of the Open Directory project versus the regular categories. I learned how to recognize the word sex in like 19 different languages. I came up with word weightings for like 480 different ways to spell uh, you know? 
So I had learned a lot of things that I did not know about pornography before I started. A lot of new words, in fact. <laughs> but at some point, you reach diminishing returns. And by the way, if anybody, I have read on Slashdot, people say, looking for porn would be the best job in the entire world. It's not. <laughs> okay? It gets old pretty quickly, in fact. So after a few months, I had a working porn version, porn classifier version, and I, I tried to make it good recall, good precision, but one person can only be so creative. And I realized other people were able to find porn that would, I would never have thought of typing in those particular <laughs> words. And, and so I sent out an email and I said, okay, everybody, I need your help. Come to this server, type in words, and on company time, look for porn. Crickets. <laughs> Nobody helped. Nobody even responded. They must have thought it was like a trap from human resources, <laughs> right? Which it probably, you know, that's not a bad guess. So I went back, I went home to my wife, and I have to give full credit to her. She said, well, look, I will bake cookies, and you can send out an email to Google, and you can say, if you are able to find pornography on this server, I will give you a cookie. <laughs> and that's how porn cookies got started. So about once a month, I would send out an email that actually said, sometimes my wife bakes cookies to encourage people to look for porn. <laughs> and every month, or whenever we had a new index, we'd... we'd we'd send out this email, and it became a bit of a tradition. Like, we would have job recruiters come and say, where's my porn cookie? And I'm like, no, 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 you have to give me some pornography first. It doesn't work like that. Uh, and in fact, it became enough of an inside joke at Google that other teams started to do similar things. So uh, these are spam cookies. And you can see cheap Viagra on there. That cookie says Cialis. Uh, <laughs> So a spam is when people try to rank higher in Google than they deserve to rank. And uh, it, it took me a while to find a G-rated version of this picture so that it didn't have certain <laughs> words on there. So that was my first major project. And I realized sometimes creativity makes a big difference. But the first major controversy that Google faced also brought creativity to play. Now, a lot of people will claim the first major controversy that Google faced was if you typed in more evil than Satan itself, we returned Microsoft at number one. <laughs> and Microsoft, I'm sure, was like, these Google guys suck. Like, why, why are they doing this? It was a result of the algorithms. Nobody had hard-coded that. Nobody meant for that to happen. But most people thought that was just sort of funny. They weren't really bothered by it. The first major controversy that we had was the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Has anybody not heard of the DMCA? Okay, I'm, yes, I'm assuming, yeah, one person is brave. Thank you. I have not heard of the DMCA. So let me, let me explain what it is. Imagine that I have written a story or a poem or something like that. And then I find out that somebody has completely ripped off my story and published it on their web page. Normally you'd go to the guy and you'd say, hey, that's not cool. Take it down. Maybe he'd take it down. Maybe he wouldn't. And if he doesn't, then you can file what's known as a Digital Millennium Copyright Act request to the web host or to Google and say, this is my story. This guy totally ripped me off. Okay, now Google is in the middle of a he said, she said. We don't really know what the truth is. So most of the time, you want to go to that other guy and you say, is that true? Did you rip this guy off? And if he decides to dispute that, if he does what's called a counter notification, then we're out of it. We're like, okay, you guys, we're covered legally. We don't need to worry about it. You solve it in court, not our problem. But if the person doesn't counter notify it, then the search engine or the information provider, they have to take that information down. So it's not really easy to tell. So for example, reefer madness. If somebody filed a DMCA complaint on that, you can see it says it's copyrighted. Do we need to take that down? You didn't expect a pop quiz, right? You would think. However, in this case, reefer madness is actually in the public domain in the United States. <laughs> Trick question, I'm sorry, that was not nice. So you can't tell, you can't write an algorithm to say this content is copyrighted or this content is safe. And so you have to rely on what individual people are saying. And so we received almost 350 million DMCA requests last year. But I want to tell you about the very first one that we received because it was from the Church of Scientology. And they wanted to suppress a critic it was a guy who ran a website called Xenu.net. He was based in Norway. And the complaint that the Church of Scientology sent in was kind of complicated. There was trademark in there, but they also did a DMCA request. Now you would think, okay, this is easy. We'll go to Norway. Here we are, going to Norway. And we'll say, look, Andres, 
Just dispute this, counter notify, and then Google's out of it. You guys can dispute it however you want. And the problem is, because the guy was based in Norway, he didn't want to counter notify because then he might have been subject to a United States lawsuit. So we were caught in a very difficult decision. We had a legal obligation to take this content down, and the person who would normally counter notify was not willing to do so. So there's a really good sentiment that I attribute to Fred Brooks. I don't put it in double quotes because it's not an exact quote, but I found an email that I wrote like over a decade ago that basically says, when faced with conflicting constraints, a good executive can often find creative solutions that satisfy apparent conflicts. Apparent conflicts. And a lot of the times, this is a mouthful, so I would rephrase it as, when the going gets tough, the tough get creative. So how did we solve this particular really difficult dilemma with the DMCA? We ended up removing the page, but we added a notice to the bottom of the page that says, due to a complaint, we have had to remove one page from the search results. And by the way, we've put the DMC com DMCA complaint at chillingeffects.org. That's a group that talks about the, the effects of free speech on, and copyright on freedom of expression. So we actually threaded the needle on that a little bit. And it's pretty interesting because we started to show that on every legal removal that we had to do. And so when we went into China, if the Chinese government said, you're not allowed to show these three results about Tiananmen Square or Falun Gong, we would take out those results only in China, not in the United States, but we'd show that notice. And the other search engine in that country, Baidu, started to add that notice as well. So it helped people get context on what the situation was, even if they weren't a Google user sometimes. So when the going get tough, look for a creative solution. If you've gone to these seminars before, Julia Grace who's the CTO of Tindy, gave a really good presentation a couple sessions ago. It's, it's on the web. And, and she gave some good advice that I just wanted to echo, which is be proactive. So uh, let me follow that with a story of how I worked in the advertising group at Google for about a year. I had really good timing. I joined Google, and the following week, Google had an all-company ski trip. Back then, the whole company could fit on a single bus. They drove up to Tahoe. It was a lot of fun. And I was on a ski lift with a manager in the ads group. I don't want to reveal all her contact info, so let's call her Jane. And Jane says, I'm done with Sergio. No, OK, Jane says, no, OK, sorry. So Jane says, hey, Matt, how do you feel about front-end programming? And I said, oh, yeah, PHP, front-end programming, that sounds fun. Just like that, I got drafted into the ads group, and I stayed there for almost a year. She was like, oh, Matt wants to become a front-end programmer. So here you go. You're now working on advertising. And uh, it didn't speak to my heart. You know, I, I learned about MySQL. I got to carry pagers, uh, all those sorts of things. So I learned a lot of skills, but I wanted to work on making search quality better. And I was in a weird situation. As working on Safe Search had taught me, it is possible to cheat and rank higher on Google than you should. And so here I was, working away on ads, and I could see people starting to spam Google. And it's like this fire over here, and you're looking at it, and you're like, trying to work. And you're like, you see people starting to spam Google. So eventually, I went to a VP of engineering. His name was Wayne, and I said, look, I want to work on spam. And he said, OK, when do you want to start? And it was just a complete shock to me. Before that, a lot of what I'd done, other than making the choice to go to Google, had been, you know what? Everybody thinks this is the right decision, so I'll make that decision. And no one cares about your career or your money more than you do. So you have to ask for what you want. Let me see if I can transition to another lesson that I learned in the early days of Google. This is a, a quote from Paul Graham. Uh, he uh, is responsible for a startup incubator called Y Combinator. And he says, a lot of startup ideas look bad at first, but they look bad because there's something that has changed or flipped in the world. The circumstances are no longer the same. So if I had to paraphrase, paraphrase this, I'd say, make your assumptions explicit and question them. Peter Thiel puts it as, what do you believe that no one else believes? Because if all you have is the conventional wisdom, if all you think is the same thing that everybody else is thinking, it's hard to set yourself apart from the crowd. It's hard to get momentum. It's hard to do something different. And that's often when you find the most disruption and the most opportunity. So this is an experiment. I don't know whether it will work, but let's give it a try. I'm really bad at questioning my assumption. 
So one way to try to approximate that is to take something from current events and say, what does that change? What is invalidated assumption-wise, or what is different in the world compared to how it used to be? So let's start with something very simple, very non-confrontational, you know, um, something that everybody can agree on. Let's talk about the Affordable Care Act and Obamacare. <laughs> so this is the part where anybody can be proactive, speak out. What is different under Obamacare? There's at least a couple things that are different under the Affordable Care Act compared to how health insurance used to work. Anybody want to shout out? There's a very strict requirement on the minimum quality of care insurance has to cover. That's absolutely true. That's totally true. Uh, that wasn't one of the two that I was thinking about, but thank you for being proactive. Have a chocolate bar. Uh, <laughs> yeah, see? When you're proactive, good things happen, right? <laughs> Anything else that people can think of? What, what else is different about life after the Affordable Care Act has passed? Now people are willing to raise hands. Yes, Russ. You can uh, stay on your parents' uh, plan up until the age of 26. That's totally true. That wasn't what I was thinking of, but take a chocolate bar. <laughs> By the way, I only have two chocolate bars, so it's... <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll wait to see. Other, other things? Pre-existing That's exact. That, thank you. You get the chocolate bar. So you can now get health insurance even if you have pre-existing conditions. That is a huge difference. There's another big difference, which is you don't have to get insurance through your employer. You can go through exchanges. So if you're looking at a life choice of going to work for IBM or going to work for yourself, you can now get health insurance even if you have a serious pre-existing condition. Now, I'm you know, kind of abbreviating things, and there's a lot of hand-waving here. But what are the implications of that? One is that there's probably going to be an increase in independent contractors, people going for startups, people going into business for themselves. And as a result of that, companies like Uber, Lyft, TaskRabbit that rely on independent contractors might be happy about Obamacare, Affordable Care Act, the ability for people to get their own insurance. And in fact, if you talk to Travis, the CEO of Uber, he's very happy about Obamacare. So something like health insurance that looks completely unrelated to startups can actually have a really big ripple effect down to something that you care about or something that you're interested in. So let's take a look at an assumption that everybody had before Google. Search engines before Google tended to rely on huge machines, big iron, they call it. Inktomi used Sun Microsystems workstations. Alta Vista was sort of a demonstration for the alpha chip. Google's machines looked more like this, hard drives inside of Legos. Okay, the sorts of machines that uh, you could go down to Fry's or Best Buy, your local you know retailer, and just pick up a copy of. And so the ability to use commodity hardware instead of these huge and really expensive things meant that Google could run a lot more cheaply. Now, it's also the case that when you do that, if you have 100 machines, they're more likely to go down, and so you have to figure out how to make them more reliable in software. But that's that's okay. That's an interesting problem. I'm not saying that it's easy, right? Because let's do a quick exercise. Suppose Google gets 5 billion queries a day. We've said that we get 100 billion queries a month, which would be 3.3 billion queries, but let's just round it to 5 billion to make it nice and do some math. Imagine you are the best programmer in the world. I am not, but imagine you're the best programmer in the world. How many queries do you think you could do before you had some catastrophic bug? Maybe one in a million? You know, 99.99999% of the time, things work perfectly. Well, it turns out you just have to do the math and divide it, and that means 5,000 catastrophic bugs a day. So you have to deal with things going up and down, corner cases, machines that go faulty. And so these were the sorts of machines that we used in the early days, like literal PC hardware. Let me just tell you about these. We called these the corkboard machines because we used a thin layer of corkboard to keep the motherboards from shorting out. I love that you can see the hard drives. We just sort of put them on the motherboard uh, and hope for the best, you know? Um, and by the way, to the best of my knowledge, all of these pictures have been shown in public, possibly in obscure places. So I don't think I'm burning anything confidential here, but I love that you can actually see the motherboards bending under the weight of the hard drives, you know? <laughs> uh, I think these were Pentium 2 machines, so like really cheap machines. And the, only, the other thing to note is like G41, G37, so that's how we named machines back then. So you'd see quotes from people like Jeff Dean that would say, 
I'm trying to suppress homicidal thoughts about SUS41, you know? And SUS41 was a crawl machine, and he was trying to get it to work reliably. Now, we got better over time, so the machines started to look more and more professional whenever we built them. But you'd still have quotes like this one from Paul Buchheit, who invented Gmail, who said, we had all these deadly crashing bugs. You know, we should avoid that. <laughs> Maybe we write the code without the deadly crashing bugs, you know? Let's try that for a change, see how that works. And we continued to build machines. We got to the point where we could take a cage in a data center and in three days completely fill it up with machines. We still had to work on the software. We had to make it reliable. For example, Chad in the ads group said, this sucks. Let's not corrupt the database again. You know, given the choice, corrupt the database or not corrupt the database, let's not corrupt the database. Oh, yeah, that would have been a good call. Uh, not fun to correct ads databases that are corrupted. So we continue to get better, and now we have data centers that look like this, that look pretty professional. But it's not just buying cheap hardware. It's not just buying cheap machines and doing it well. There's all kinds of different insights you can have where there's an inflection point. So for example, a mechanical hard drive takes about 10 sec milliseconds to seek. There's an arm that physically has to move to the right place on a platter. On the other hand, if you have everything in RAM, instead of being able to do only about 100 seeks per second, you can do a lot of seeks. And you need to do those seeks when people type in users' queries. So if you put your entire index of the web, not on a hard disk, but in RAM, which is a lot of money, a lot of money, you can still get much higher throughput. So the trade-off might be worth it. So it was those kinds of insults, uh, insults, those kinds of insights <laughs> that, it was an insult to ink to me. They were very unhappy with how cheaply Google could run that helped us do well. So that leads to a natural question. Well, was it commodity hardware? Is that why Google succeeded? And I realized that no, actually success is dozens or hundreds of different innovations. So whenever I joined Google, I thought I was smart. I did my homework. I read every paper there was about PageRank before I got there, like six or seven different papers, including the hard to find ones. And I was like, ha, I know how PageRank works. I'm going to land you know, running. And they were doing much different, much more sophisticated stuff than had ever appeared in the papers or had ever been published in the patents. And it wasn't just PageRank. You, know, we've, we, you can search for these abstractions, Spanner, Google File System, MapReduce. Like Fred Brooks, there's rarely a silver bullet in software engineering. Sometimes with things like MapReduce, you can write code at a higher level of, of abstraction. Spanner is actually cool. It takes an insight that you can keep data synchronized between North Carolina and California data centers by using GPS, very precise timing, which a few people have had that insight before, but it's a really nice insight. But it's not just like you have one shining epiphany and then everything is fixed. It takes dozens or hundreds of different things to make a really successful company or a successful career. Uh, another lesson that I learned, I, I, I want to make sure I save enough time. Well, we're doing okay on time. So um, whenever I started working on Safe Search, uh, I had a different mindset. I was trying to figure out how much data I needed to store all the safe search data. So one bit per document for whether a document is porn or not, call 5% of the web porn. I did the calculations and I went to an engineer and I said, it's going to take a lot of data to say, you know, to have this safe search work on all the machines. And the engineer, his name was Sanjay, said, okay, how much data are we talking about? And I said, man, it's, it's going to be like like 20 gigabytes. <laughs> and he just bust out laughing. He almost busted a guy. He was like, you call that data, that's not data. Like Paul Hogan from Crocodile Dundee, that's not a knife, this is a knife, you know? And, uh, and it's kind of interesting. Lots of data can make a lot of computations much easier. So for example, back in 1999, Artificial intelligence, people call it machine learning now oftentimes, had not had as much progress in the last 15 years or so. So you weren't really able to take an artificial intelligence class at UNC Chapel Hill before that time because there wasn't a lot going on there. But remember, assumptions have to be questioned and, and circumstances change. So if you have a lot of data and you can do either a sophisticated algorithm or even a dumb algorithm, you can do some pretty cool stuff. So this is a system called Brain where the, the folks at Google basically said, let's have the computer watch YouTube and see what we can learn. And they used a neural network. It was a deep neural network, many layers of neurons. And it basically developed its own neuron to recognize cats, <laughs> which is a little weird if you think about it. And it sounds kind of gimmicky, but you can use that same kind of processing to do better word recognition. 
So since 2012, every Android phone after Jelly Bean has much better word error rate voice recognition because of a deep neural network. You could train for five days and do a ton of work on the server side, but then the actual weights were pretty compact, enough so that you could put them on an individual phone. And 30% drop in word er error rate was like the biggest improvement in, in speech recognition they'd had in years and years and years. So circumstances change. You have to be willing to adapt to it. You can do a lot of stuff with data. It's now the case that we can do image recognition enough that if you upload your photos to Google Drive and you know, set all the right settings, you can go to Google and search for my photos of waterfalls, and it will show you pictures of waterfalls. Or my photos of buildings, and it will show you pictures of buildings. Or my photos of Yosemite. And I you know, had a trip there a few months ago. Those are all pictures I took, and those are all from Yosemite. You can type in my pictures of palm trees, or airplanes, or sea, or snow, or whatever. There's like a thousand different things that this system can recognize now. So if you have enough data, you can do some pretty interesting stuff. This is the last result that they had recently. They can actually take a picture, and the computer writes the caption. So given a picture, you can write a person riding a motorcycle on a dirt road, or a group of young people playing a game of Frisbee. So you have to remember to question your assumptions. Back in 1999, everybody was like, AI is stupid, it'll never be anything, no, we're not going to offer any courses on it. That's not the case anymore. Things have changed. And a lot of that is that there's a lot more data in the world. Okay, I don't know if I've made it sound like Google was all fun and games and success to success and there was never any bad time. So I feel like I need to insert one slide of wet blanket. And that is, things will go badly and you have to prepare yourself for that. I remember every lawsuit and every deposition that I got involved with, and those are not fun for an engineer. Um, and the disputes, they don't go away. You know, we had a lawsuit called Search King about whether Google is allowed to rank its search results the way that we think is best. And we had another lawsuit called Kinderstart. And then after we would want, win those lawsuits, it started to turn into situations with world governments eventually. You know, North Korea, Russia, China all have different ideas about how Google ought to be ranking things or not ranking things. So you need to still yourself for the idea that even if you're doing well, even if the company is doing well, there will be dark days, there will be personal conflicts, there will be problems, and just prepare yourself for that a little bit mentally. But okay, now let me have a little bit of fun. The other lesson that I would mention is take more pictures. Digital is cheap. You could record every meeting at your company or startup now if you wanted to. And 15 or 10 years down the road, you are going to remember or want to remember the ping pong table where eight of you would sit around a table and talk about how do we make Google search quality better. You're going to want to remember Yoshka, who is this huge dog, Leonberger. Like, when he comes running at you, you just, you're terrified. It was awful. We have a cafe named after Yoshka now. Uh, he passed away a while ago, but he was a good, good dog. You want to remember even whenever you wrestle with spammers. So we'll call him a former spammer. This is a guy named Greg. And uh, when you go to search conferences, sometimes people would beat you up a little bit, and sometimes you'd beat them up a little bit back. Uh, but when you look back on it, yeah, there's usually a lot of fun fondness there. Uh, sometimes people make fun of you. Whoop. Oh. Whoa. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Ah. I don't even know what happened there. As soon as I show one slide about spam, boom. <laughs> Should have known. Okay, people might make fun of you. I like the don't tell Matt Cutts shirt that this guy is wearing. But whenever I look at that picture, I just say, oh man, my hair used to be completely brown. That was so nice. The good old days. And try to take pictures when something funny or quirky happens. So we, we had caught a company that was spamming. And uh, we threw them out, and they sent in what's called a re-inclusion request. They wanted to get back into Google, and they sent us a cookie. Now, I should have included a banana or something for scale, because this was the size of a pizza. It was like a really, really big cookie. If you had caught someone cheating, would you eat that cookie? <laughs> We had a fun discussion about that. We weren't, you know, you could put some poison, some phenolphthalein in there to, you know, generate some interesting conditions. I think we did end up eating the cookie. <laughs> um, but when weird things happen, you want to take a picture of that. And it's not just uh, weird things. Sometimes it helps to have good traditions. 
So two of the favorite holidays at Google are April Fool's and Halloween. And we have another great one, which happens every single week. The founders of the company, Larry and Sergey, get up. And for a few minutes, they introduce the new Googlers or Nooglers. Then they talk about all the stuff that happened in the last week. And then for about half an hour, you're allowed to grill the founders of the company. And there's, it's really entertaining to stand up and ask a billionaire, why did you do it this way? And why don't you do this differently? And it really helps everybody be on the same page within the company. So for example, April Fools, we had a VP of engineering, I mentioned his name is Wayne, from Santa Barbara. So we brought Santa Barbara to him. We bought 200 pounds of sand, <laughs> and we turned his office into a beach. Uh, and the guy with the office right next to him was like, the value of my office just went up because now I have beachfront property. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to have a little bit of fun. Uh, we have uh, a chef, Charlie, who actually cooked for the Grateful Dead. So one Halloween, I dressed up like Charlie and wore my tie-dye shirt, you know, and had a little bit of fun with it. And, and Googlers tend to get into Halloween quite a bit. One of my favorite traditions is doing bets with my team. This is me getting my hair shaved off. I bet that they couldn't do a really good job on fighting spam for an entire quarter, and they got motivated, and they did, and so they were allowed to do whatever they wanted to my hair, and they decided to take it all off. So if you search for like map cuts and haircut and bet, you can watch on YouTube like two and a half minutes of these people just having fun. They tried to do a Chrome logo in the back, and that didn't work out well, and they're like, let's just take it all off. Um, but those kinds of things make it more fun. Whether it's kayaking or camping together or playing laser tag, it makes it feel more like a family than just coworkers or something like that. OK, so this is my second to last slide. This is my tedious sum up, what have we heard? You know, I, I just wanted to tell some stories, but you know, the lessons. When you think you're caught between a rock and a hard place, think about Fred Brooks and think about his advice to get creative and think about maybe there's some other solution beyond the rock and the hard place that might solve the apparent conflicts. You, you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. right? So ask for what you want. Be proactive. You would be amazed at how much of a difference it makes when you just tell somebody, I would like to do X. Because I've been a manager, and if I know someone wants to work on something, they're going to work about twice as hard, and they're going to be more persistent at it. So ask for what you want. Question your assumptions, because they don't always apply. And if you don't set yourself apart from the crowd in some way, it's hard to get enough momentum to succeed. No matter what, some weird bad things are going to happen, but along the way, have some fun and take some pictures. So my very last slide is I wanted to close with another quote from Fred Books, who's a fantastic guy and a, and a pillar of the computer science community. I've always thought about Google as a tool. You know, Google can be used to search for all kinds of things, bad stuff as well as good. So we think of Google like a tool, and we try to make it the best tool that we can be. And Fred has a great paper called The Computer Scientist as Toolsmith, where he says, a toolmaker succeeds as and only as the users of his tool succeed with his aid. So whatever you're working on, try to make sure that it's something that matters and something that you care about, and that's something that people want. The Computer Science Department has a fund called the Toolsmith Fund. And it's sort of discretionary spending. It's uh, things like you know, pizza after, uh, you know, after a seminar, or a reception, or sending someone to speak at a conference. So it's a really good cause. I'm going to donate to the Toolsmith Fund. If you've got alumni in here, or, or people who have been touched in a positive way by the Computer Science Department, or by UNC in general, uh, I'd recommend donating to the Toolsmith Fund. If you search for like UNC Toolsmith on your favorite search engine, you'll, <laughs> you'll probably find it. Okay, with that, I think we've got time for whatever people want to ask, question-wise. Thank you. <laughs>